Hello, welcome back to another episode of Explosions and Fire. How are we all? Don't have to answer that. Don't, please don't answer that. You, everything is fine. All right, really, I got to level with you here. Chemistry isn't hard, all right? It's easy. Just learn all the rules and then learn all the exceptions to the rules. But there are exceptions. One of these exceptions is chemical incompatibilities because there's generally no sort of general rule that applies to all of chemical incompatibilities. A lot of it, you just have to look up and think, hey, are these two things going to explode if I mix them together? It's commonly accepted that you never mix alkali metals and chlorinated solvents. But why is that? What exactly happens? We know alkali metals, that's just sodium and potassium. You chuck them into water, they explode. They're highly reactive substances. <laughs> chlorinated solvents, on the other hand, really aren't all that reactive. You're using them as solvents, as a bulk thing to dissolve everything up. Very common item in a normal organic laboratory. To look at examples of what might actually happen, we can go to the font of all chemistry knowledge, YouTube, and look up all examples of alkali metals and chlorinated solvents. And we only come across two, one of which ends in a violent detonation, And one of which just sort of happens. Olive oil and chloroform with a density of 1.4. I'm gonna take sodium and put it in olive oil to start with, and it should sink. It should float, as displayed here. So the question is, which one of these examples is correct? Was this guy split seconds away from disaster? This force is called, known as buoyancy. Or did this guy's experiments get rigged by Richard Hammond? Okay, John, go for it. Does anyone remember that? Do you remember that time that they faked that alkali metal episode? I remember watching that as a kid. Oh, yes. Brilliant. I like it already. Now, what's that going to do when it hits the water? No wonder I'm making bad science shows as an adult. God, what a terrible example they set for me that I followed. It's all coming together, fuck. Imagine a depth charge in a bathtub. Fair enough. So the only way to find out really is to test it, but first of all, we need to assemble the squad. What are the chlorinated solvents? First of all, we have dichloromethane, or DCM. To get it, it's sold as this horrible, goopy mixture with some polymer and methanol as paint stripper in the local hardware store. It's pretty awful to deal with initially, it's all goopy, but you do get a free My Little Pony figurine at the bottom of every jar, so that's... No, no. To get pure DCM, we heat it up just above 40 degrees, the DCM boils out and we collect it. To clean it up, we wash it with water to wash out any methanol. Then we just add a couple of pinches of kosher salt, shake it around to get rid of the last bits of water, and then redistill it. And hey presto, we have pretty clean, reasonably dry dichloromethane. Next up, we have trichloromethane or chloroform. It might not surprise you to learn that you can't just buy chloroform at the local hardware store these days. I'm sure you could in the 60s. But we do have to make it ourselves, which isn't particularly hard. We just need a ketone and a hypochlorite, which sounds very complicated, but really we just get some acetone and some pool chlorine and mix it together. Make sure that it doesn't run away, so we need ice baths and cooling, that sort of thing, to make sure it doesn't uh, run over itself. But once it's done, we can distill it out of the reaction mixture. We can just do it on the same day that we're running the DCM bloody distillation and I can hit peak efficiencies that I've never hit before and never will again, honestly. And then once again, we're just drying it with our kosher salt and bottling it up. We probably should run another distillation, but look, it should be fine. It's not, but we'll get to that later. Last of all, we need tetrachloromethane or carbon tet, which is kind of chloroform's older, more poisonous, boomer uncle. Because of carbon tet's toxicity and its innate ability just to destroy the ozone layer, basically it's been completely phased out since the 80s. You're not allowed to import it, you're not allowed to export it, you're not allowed to manufacture it, you're not allowed to use it in the industry. No one has been using it since the 80s or importing it, so it's impossible to get. The only way for me to legally get carbon tet is if someone from the 1960s got the volatile solvent, bolted it up so well that it didn't leak, and then just put it on a shelf for several decades and it sat there undisturbed Perfect condition. I found some. Turns out in the 1960s, God bless you 1960s, it was commonplace for this very toxic solvent to be used in fire extinguishers, sort of in household levels. Four people realized that while it was putting out fires, it was also setting fire to the atmosphere and setting fires to people's livers. Anyway, we can just crack open the cylinder, do some distillation. Finally, we have the whole goddamn squad. Squad. 
So now we can just chuck lumps of sodium in to each of these and see what happens. First of all, dichloromethane. Nothing. <laughs> There's no reaction really at all. It bubbles slightly, but given how much water is slightly left in the DCM, I'd say that's just from the water left over there, so nothing's happening. Even if we dump a whole lot of water into that dichloromethane, it seems like the DCM is lowering the reaction of the sodium. It seems like the vapors of the DCM are stopping the oxygen getting in, so it doesn't burn really as well as you would expect sodium to normally burn. Now we have all this dichloromethane and water waste, so we have to dispose of this somehow. If you're freaked out by that, you just gotta remember that the actual original product is sold to just be a paint stripper and the dichloromethane is just meant to go into the atmosphere. That's what it's designed to do. I don't have to dispose of it in these small amounts. I'm not a big industrial polluter. The atmosphere is nature's bin. <laughs> no, <laughs> I can't say that. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, it's just my bin. Next up, we have sodium and chloroform. Now this is a real immediate reaction. And the mixture goes red pretty much straight away and then quickly goes all black and disgusting. While this is an immediate reaction, I actually going to ignore this result because I have a feeling that red color comes from acetone reacting with sodium. And where's the acetone come from? The fact that we didn't redistill our chloroform. So maybe if we have very, very good pure chloroform, it won't react with the sodium. Uh, so, I mean, so yes, that's kind of an open question, but I really want to move on to the next point, sodium and carbon tet. This is the one that has the biggest reputation for being very dangerous. Carbon tet is a fantastic solvent that the Western world just doesn't use anymore, which is a good thing, but you can't ever use it anywhere near alkali metals. But we put sodium in here, nothing happens. If we think about what's actually happening here with the alkali metals and the solvent, the alkali metals, they want to pull hydrogens off of things. And if you've got a spare hydrogen, that carbon hydrogen bond is pretty weak. So you can pull them off the chloroform and the dichloromethane. And then all of a sudden you have highly reactive radicals that which can go on and cause other reactions. Carbon tet has no hydrogens. It's just a fortress of carbon to chlorine bonds. So how can the alkali metal react with it if it's just made up of those really four strong bonds? So, I was going to give up on the project. I thought, well, fuck, maybe it's a thing that only happens on big industrial scales and maybe there's something subtly going on, very small level that I can't tell and it's all pretty boring. That's when one of my Discord admins, Doyle, reminded me that there's a whole load of information out on the internet that isn't just on Wikipedia. That's right, German Wikipedia. Turns out there was this guy called Straudinger. Straudinger? It's called Straudinger. He was on a mission to make diamonds. He just wanted to make diamonds. Buddy, old school alchemist, 1920s Germany, sure, whatever. He would take carbon tetrachloride, sodium, and a little bit of explosives, blow it up in a big explosive proof container. The sodium would rip the chlorine from the carbon to make sodium chloride, and then he'd just be left with the carbon, which would form into diamonds. In typical style, he just scales it up a fuck ton. Problem is, it doesn't just blow up and stay within the explosive proof box. The sodium detonates with the carbon tetrachloride, so the whole thing turns into one giant explosion. A very, very huge explosion. He doesn't recover any diamonds from this experiment. In fact, I don't think he even really recovers a lot of his hearing from this experiment. Yep, it's fucking time to break out the hammer. Gotta put that into there. You have to actually hit it first time. I don't like my chances. Miss. Oh. Nearly. Ah, oh, this is frustrating. You'd think after all these years of doing energetics testing, I'd be good at using a hammer, but I'm not. I don't know why. I'm just horrendous at hitting a tiny target with a giant hammer. No.
So there's really no good explosions from this. Really, the carbon tent and the sodium weren't a really good mixture when I was hitting it with a hammer. So I became a five minute craft YouTuber, fucking bought a hot glue gun, and I fucking five minute crafted my way for hours. I came up with this monstrosity, which allows me to hit carbon tent and sodium and for it to be in a pretty much sealed environment. Even after all five of those minutes of craft, we're still not getting any explosion. We once again have to go back to the source of all information, not YouTube, Germany. Here we have a paper from last year, straight out of Wuppertal in Germany, telling us exactly what we need to know. This paper really just sums up this video much better than the video does. They managed to quantify it and they show that adding a little bit of hexane also changes the tendency to explode. And a crucial bit of information, potassium is a whole lot more sensitive than just sodium. So instead of trying to smack it with a hammer even harder because I'm just awful at hitting stuff with a hammer, let's move on to potassium metal. Potassium metal is a lot more reactive, so it's of no surprise that it would actually blow up easier with the carbon tet than the sodium would. So once again, we subject our chemicals to approximately five minutes of craft and we're ready to hit it with a giant hammer. Oh, yeah. And right there we have a proper explosion. The potassium is ripping off those chlorines from the carbon tet, forming carbon, releasing a huge amount of energy, which we see in that explosion. This sort of thing doesn't happen if you just hit potassium by itself. It just doesn't react like that. Now, all I needed was to get this same reaction on slow-mo because I wanted it on slow-mo and missed I it. missed out on the first time. So, <laughs> I spent a whole fucking day just doing this and trying to get it on slow-mo. No! I kept trying and trying until eventually I just thought, well, fuck it, why don't I just scale up the amount of potassium? Even if then I clip it slightly, there's heaps of potassium to react. So I made the perfect craft. I spent like six minutes on this craft. It was absolutely perfect and I fucking nailed it. Ha! I think we got it. <laughs> yeah. It was very loud. <laughs> I liked it. You might be asking, what happened to that guy who blew up that quarry back in the 1920s doing this reaction? I like to think this one huge explosion was enough for him. It was just the pinnacle of his scientific research. I like to imagine him very old, remembering back on his career and thinking that was definitely my crowning scientific moment ahead of the time I developed an entire field of chemistry and also won the Nobel Prize. Once again, I'd like to thank my Patreons. Thanks for sticking by me all these months. You can join the Discord. We're about to hit 3,000 members, which is amazing. If you win the Nobel Prize, you're a sellout. Um, don't do drugs. Don't go to school. Stay indoors. Don't dump things in the atmosphere. I don't know. That's about it. As you can see, it's floating. I love you, Hammer.